You're listening to The Dead Prussian, a podcast about war and warfare. But where do you go after remaining in the same rank for 20 years? What is the role of a general staff officer? How did the Australian veterans of North Africa use their experience in New Guinea? And most importantly, what is a berry force? G'day listeners, I've snuck into the Strategic and Defence Studies College at the Australian National University. I'm here to try and find some answers to those questions and more. In particular, I'm trying to find out how you can recover a career that has spent 20 years as a major. I have a feeling that this will become very, very important. My guest today, or I should actually say my host, is Dr Peter Dean. He's a senior fellow in the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre and the Australian Command and Staff College. He was the 2014 Fulbright Scholar in the Australia-United States Alliance Studies and was the Associate Dean of Education for the Australian National University's College of Asia and the Pacific in 2015 and this year. His major research and teaching interests are in Australian strategic policy, the ANZUS Alliance, and for those non-Australian, New Zealand or US people that don't know what the ANZUS Alliance is, I won't explain it, look it up, Google is a thing. Other interests include military operations and defence studies. Peter is the author slash editor of six books. They are Australia's American Alliance, Australia's Defence, A New Era, The Architect of Victory, Australia 1942 in the Shadow of War, Australia 1943, The Liberation of New Guinea, and Australia 1944 to 1945, Victory in the Pacific. He teaches courses on military operations and expeditionary warfare and on Australia's strategic alliances. He is a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy and in 2011 was a recipient of a citation for outstanding contributions to student learning in the Australian Learning and Teaching Council's Australian Awards for University Teaching. But most importantly, He's a mate of mine who doesn't mind answering the odd red herring or two. And I tend to throw them at him, uh, I wouldn't say weekly, but pretty close. Peter, uh, thanks for appearing on the show. Thanks uh, for having me, Mick. I find your work captivating, and I recommend it to all my students, even the ones who don't like it. How's that? Did that go okay? I mean, is that that's what you wrote for me here to say, so I think I got that right. Yeah, so we're just having a little bit of trouble with the talent at the moment. <laughs> So, Peter, um, actually, thanks for going on script. Most of my guests say a lot of other things when I give them my recommended statement. My first question, though, is not about how much you like the show. It is actually about how a historian ends up teaching at the Australian Command Staff College. What led you from your days as an undergrad student, probably with long hair, to authoring six books and having such a great office view? Ah, it's... A long story, but I'll try and keep it short. I think part of it's a bit of the road not travelled, Mick. I could be sitting in your shoes. You know, the, the original ambition had been to join the Australian Army, but uh, I went to university, I joined the reserves, and I thought, well, this getting up in the morning before the sun comes up is not so great, and people shout at me a lot. <laughs> so maybe I, uh, I might just keep that to the reserve stuff and, and concentrate on the uni work. And after that, I did a bit of school teaching, realised that probably wasn't a, a long-term future and career path. And so I went back to, to do a PhD, which is what I always wanted to do, and a bit of time at the University of Notre Dame, and lucky enough to get a job here at the ANU just as we got the, the contract to teach out at the Australian Command and Staff College. So it's a really enjoyable experience out there. It's good to have a captive audience, audience that has to be there, uh, an audience that for many of them promotion depends on whether they listen to me or not. And so, uh, so that's always great to have people like that to talk to. It's interesting that you say a uh, captive audience and, you know, quite rightly, they are an audience of captives. Now, I'm sure the listeners found all that very interesting. I was actually just looking at your bookshelf. But I want to talk about the architect of victory, Frankie B, as he was known in his time, but we'll refer to him by his full name, uh, Francis Horton Berryman. Can you give our listeners a quick overview of who he was? Sure. I think 
probably start with his nickname in the army, which was Berry the Bastard. So I think that might give you a, your listeners a bit of a context. He, he did soften a little bit in his later years, but certainly he's a, he's a pretty hard man for hard circumstances. So Frank was born in Victoria, he's the son of a, a railway engineer and uh, was quite an intellectual young guy and managed to get himself in those days a scholarship to Melbourne High School, which is the big high school to go to if you couldn't afford private schooling. And from there he went to RMC. So Melbourne High was very big on cadets in those those days. He was very heavily involved in the cadets and his best mate at school, uh, about a year or so above him at school, went off to, to, start, to RMC. So he thought he'd give it a go and, and he went off to, to RMC. Went in 1913, graduated just as... Uh, early because the war had started and very interestingly enough he becomes an artillery officer Mick you might know something about that but funnily enough he wasn't given that opportunity they graduated his class early they lined them up on the parade ground and they said right light horse of infantry take your pick and a young cadet by the name of Wackett put his hand up and said neither and of course probably not a wise choice when you were at RMC but he got they went away the staff they had to think about it spoke to army headquarters come back the next day put them on parade again said anyone else want to be in do something else. Who wants to be an artillery officer? And, and, a, and a bunch of them put their hand forward, including uh, Frank Berryman, including a guy named George Vasey, another guy named Cyril Close, another guy named Bridgeford, all of whom became generals in the Second World War, so probably a smart career choice. <laughs> From there he went off and did the normal regimental duty on the Western Front, was a battery commander, worked in the 4th Field Artillery Brigade, then went on to an infantry brigade and ended the war with a couple of gongs at DSO and mentioned in dispatches and stuff as a brigade major with the 7th Infantry Brigade come back as a major and then spent the long dark interwar year periods for 20 odd years as a, as a major. In those days they had what was called brevet rank so he came back from the AIF as a major, his substantive rank in the army was like lieutenant so they allowed him to keep his rank but they liked to pay him as a lieutenant and then it took a few more years before they promoted him to captain and they, he was still allowed to call himself major and it wasn't until basically uh, until just before the war started that he actually got formally promoted to lieutenant colonel. And, uh, and from there into the Second World War. So Second World War staff jobs in, in North Africa, command jobs in Syria, and then uh, staff jobs when he comes back to Australia as a Major General, then Corps Command, and then ends up the end of the war as, as Australia's number one Chief of Staff, Chief of Operations. He's sort of, as I said in the book, the architect of victory because he's the Chief Planning Officer of the Army in the Second World War in the Pacific. There's some very important things to note there. The list of notables Artillery is a smart choice, um, very, very important, good for your career, and also that you can spend a fair bit of time as a major and still be of use to the organisation. It's interesting that artillery men and women seem to be possessed of a talent for, well, everything, I guess. Now, Berryman was pretty important to the Australian forces uh, throughout the Second World War, but what role did he play in the North African and Syrian campaigns? Well, when they created the second AIF to go off and fight in the Second World War, the first division they formed was the 6th Division. And Berryman, as a regular army officer, and the regular army was very small at that stage, it was mainly designed to be staff officers and to support the part-time citizen militia. So he was given the job as what was called the GSO-1. So the army in those days had two senior staff officers. The GSO-1 was the operations and training officer, and the other one being the administration and logistics officer, basically. So he was the chief planning officer of the division and also tended to act as the de facto chief of staff of the division. So he went to North Africa and he did the operational planning for the assault at Bardia um, in the early North African campaigns, which is a highly successful Australian victory in North Africa. And then Trebrook, people mostly know Trebrook for the famous siege of Trebrook, but we had to actually take it first. And it was the Australian 6th Division with some, port, with some British units um, and formations who did that. And again, Berryman was the senior planning officer. They were quite intricate, in some ways complicated plans, but he managed to pull them off very successfully and really made a name for himself as a staff officer to watch, as someone, a man on the rise, so to speak. And it was North Africa and Syria where Berry Force comes into being, is that correct? Yeah, so after his very successful time in North Africa, the 6th Division, he gets promoted to Brigadier, so yeah, only a, only a small time as a colonel, you know, after 20 years as a major, a couple of years as a lieutenant colonel about a year as a colonel and then he's off to be a brigadier and he's given the job as the commander of the uh, artillery in the 7th division and the 7th division is tagged two of its brigades one of uh, gets tagged to go off and fight in the Syrian campaign a very little known campaign in the second world war we, of course we fight the Vichy French and the British certainly sent us there on the hope that 
they would see our Australian slouch hats and uh, and take you know a nice view of us and not shoot at us. Well, that sort of didn't work out very well, <laughs> and they shot at us a lot. But Berryman was a uh, commander of the artillery there and a, a very innovative commander. Liked to use his guns in very innovative, flexible ways. Everywhere from from major fires and uh, and battery level fires through to single guns being used over open sites against tanks or against uh, direct against infantry support positions. But during the campaign, we, uh, we get counter-attacked by the French, who've got a quite a significant armour division, and we have no armour. And, uh, and they splice the Australians right down the middle at a, a town called Mergeong in Syria. And Berryman's the man in, in the locale. The divisional commander basically says, you're in charge, and pulls together units from all over the place, some British units, some Australian units, and uh, creates this sort of brigade formation he names Berry Force. And it's actually the largest brigade in the, in the operation. Um, he handles it very successfully and in fact uses his guns most importantly very successfully because he has no armour to defeat the French armour and also to outflank the town and cut it off and forcing the, the French to withdraw because he uses his artillery to pound their supply lines and uh, rather than making it a frontal attack, which he does, tr does try and doesn't quite work so well, so he figures using his guns and doing the flank attack is much better. So it's the largest, the largest brigade command the Australians have during the Syrian campaign and it's quite successful. It's good to note that uh, where armour don't show up for the fight, artillery is able to shape it the way that it needs to go. Um, there's a few listeners out there that probably owe uh, Berryman some beers. I will take those as payment uh, for him. Now, he also uh, moved on to the Papua and New Guinea campaigns, which you know is one of uh, Australia's most iconic campaigns. The Kokoda track is in the lexicon of every household in Australia. But most people don't know who Frank Berryman was. Most people know about uh, the retaking of Lay, but they probably don't know about the operation that was designed to do that. It seems to be that we haven't, in Australia's commemoration of New Guinea, uh, fully understood all the aspects of it. There seems to be the romanticised version, and then there seems to be a fair bit of silence. So what exactly was Berryman's involvement, and... In discussing it, a little bit of a idea on the campaign uh, for the listeners. Please. Sure. So Berryman finishes up Syria, gets his command taken off him, and he's a bit devastated by this. Um, he ends up in hospital with exhaustion, and then the corps commander, the Australian corps commander, comes along and taps him on the shoulder as his chief of staff. So he goes off to be the chief of staff. They come back when the Pacific War starts from, from North Africa to the Pacific. And by the time he gets back to Australia after a little bit of a detour to Java, there for a little while, he's promoted again. So another quick turnaround from Brigadier <laughs> to now becomes a Major General and he becomes the Chief of Staff of the 1st Australian Army. And that's got defence of, uh, of the northern part of Australia. And soon after that, the Commander-in-Chief Blamey comes along and taps him on the shoulder to be his Chief Staff Officer. So the Deputy Chief of the General Staff, which is a Senior operations officer of the Australian Army and of course in that in those days the senior operation officer of the Allied Land Forces so that includes the Americans as well and so Berryman gets his job sort of after right at, we're at the critical point of the uh, the Gokota campaign the Australians are retreating the Americans are very unhappy with us they're blaming us for having to fall back Berryman's brought in because he's he can get along with the Americans a bit better than his predecessor and he makes his big commitment that we're going to stand firm on the Kokoda Trail and and the new brigade commander who goes up there is one of his protégés. And so he gives him a good rap and says it's all going to be good. And the brigadier looks at one look at the ground and turns around and retreats another 20 miles back to, to Port Moresby. So it doesn't go down so well with the Americans and Douglas MacArthur. But from then on, that's when the sort of tide turns in the Papillon campaign. Soon after that, Blame is actually sent up to be the commander on the ground. And he brings Berryman with him to be his chief of staff. So he gets two jobs. So he's... DCGS running the, the whole of land forces. Now he's also the, the chief of staff of the army that's based in New Guinea. So he's doing both jobs because Blame is doing both jobs. So he does the, basically the operational planning and the organisation. And then because he doesn't have enough to do and he's become so trusted by the commander in chief now by Blamey, he sends him over the Iron Stanley Ranges during the battles for Boonagona and Sandananda to sort out the, the core headquarters that's up there. So he's uh, the Chief of Staff of the Corps, the Chief of Staff of the Army and the Chief of Staff of the Allied Land Forces all at the same time. <laughs> so he has a pretty prominent role in that particular campaign. But as we successfully complete that and we pull back, the Army goes into a rebuilding phase. Um, we leave 
the good old Chocos up in uh, New Guinea to fight the Japanese, the third militia or division which is made up of the citizen military forces and, and I'm a good Choco myself for 12 years so very proud of their achievements. And Berman comes back and he does the planning for the, for the retaking of the next phase of the New Guinea campaign and it's kind of blaming the commander in chief, it's his concept but it's certainly Berryman's plan. And he does all the high level planning, all the coordination with the Americans, with the air power, with the Navy, and comes up with a really innovative plan. And that is, they're gonna, they need to take lay the main Japanese base. The militia up there are doing the, the deception operation. And he decides that they're gonna use the whole of the 9th Division in amphibious assault just outside of lay. But even more innovative than that for the time is they decide to land a, an American airborne uh, regiment on an old disused airstrip on the other side of Ley and then fly in the whole of this 7th Australian Division. So for those times this is exceptionally innovative. The first use of airborne troops in the Pacific in the Second World War, the first combined use of, of air power in that way to a large scale of, of air landing a division into, straight into combat off the airfield. They trialled that a little bit earlier in one other operation but this is on a much bigger scale and of course combining that with a major amphibious assault. So. And it goes exceptionally well, so well that it happens too quickly. The Japanese are defeated too quickly. And so Berrien then moves on to, to organising the next phase of the campaign and, and he's rewarded with the, the command of the Corps for the last phase of the, the campaign in New Guinea. So this is the largest operations the Australian military has ever undertaken. We've got five infantry divisions on operations, the whole of the, the ninth operational group of the Royal Australian Air Force and pretty much everything the Navy can muster in terms of supporting the amphibious landing and the, uh, the maritime lines of supply. So it's uh, hardly known. I think most Australians' knowledge of the New Guinea campaign sort of begins and ends on the Kokoda Trail. And what happens in that next big phase is Australia's most, I, I think, successful military operation we've un ever undertaken at the forefront, defeating the Japanese with exceptionally innovative operational and tactical approaches. And hardly anyone knows about it. Mm. So probably don't even know the name. Of Most people don't. Yeah, Operation Postern it's called for the uh, the assault on Ley and and uh, the Huon Peninsula and the Markham Valley. But yeah, it's it's not very well known and it's it's a great success. We we talk about Gallipoli, you know, which is a bit of a failure. Kokoda, where we're on the back foot and we sort of overcome the overcome the odds eventually. And uh, and this is when we're on the front foot. And it's a big success, but it's not a success that was in any way inevitable. This was a stage of the war where the Japanese air and naval power and their ground force power was in many ways evenly balanced. And so we took a lot of risk. That risk paid off. It was very well measured and calculated risks and a, and a, and a very well planned operation. And unlike, you know, the First World War, I know you've done a lot of First World War stuff. <laughs> yeah. The First World War mafia have been into you, Mick, doing, doing stuff on that. And of course... <laughs> Australians have an important role to play there, but you know Monash is not coordinating a whole operational group of the Air Force. He's not coordinating amphibious landings and, and the use of air power. So this is a much more expansive way of doing manoeuvre at the operational level. And, uh, and we're, we're very good at it, you know, and we do very well. And, and, and not enough people study it, understand it, and particularly it's about how we operate as a military in our own region as well. And that's another really important uh, lesson to take away from this. Uh, some of the other important lessons I took away from it was that um, because Berryman was a gunner, he could do what we call a sim mission and be chief of staff for nearly anyone who was looking for one. Shopping around for a chief of staff, we have a Berry force for you. But Operation Postern, as you mentioned, is something that was a success and maybe perhaps in Australia's cultural memory, that's why it doesn't get up. The underdog story is something that we tend to stick to but it's very very important I think for us also to look at our successes because when you look at what doesn't work sometimes you also need to look at what does work because it gives you a nice blueprint to emulate. Now we have come to the butcher's bill of the dead Prussian podcast. Your price for letting me on campus, letting me in your office is to help us in our mission and it's very similar to the mission of Big Carl, the original uh, dead Prussian. We are trying to understand war, and we are trying to frame the debate on war by understanding how we define war. Now, you're right, I have spoken to a lot of World War I people this year. They just are very, very eager, and for some reason not as busy as anyone else, although it is the centenary, so you'd think they'd be the busiest. I guess I probably should stop camping out at the War Memorial and interviewing anyone who walks past me. But... It's very interesting to see how different scholars of different eras define war as well. So, I invite you, before we go for a beer, 
to offer a definition and engage in this debate. War is? A very complex human endeavour. So in many ways I think war is a living organism, particularly once it's given a life by human beings, you know, the decision to make to go to war. And I think it's important to realise how, like a living organism, it adapts, it changes, it evolves. Um, and it's incredibly complex, like a, like a living organism is. And ultimately, I think, as well, war is about people. You know, it's people who make the decision to go to war. It's people who fight wars. It's people who make the decision to end wars. It's the people who utilise the technology that we talk about. And in the end, war is undertaken for innate human interests. So I think it's a, it's a very complex organism that we have to attempt to understand it's very important to understand it or to try and learn from it but uh, my good friend and colleague Reese Crawley I was listening to you talk to him about this the other day and I you know I have to agree with the World War One mafia here that it's uh, you know the human dimension as Reese mentioned is, is critically important to war it's too easy to get caught up in technology and fads you know in that this particular piece of technology or this capability will change warfare forever and you know plenty of people have tried that and no one's really succeeded in the end the dead Prussian was right. It's a continuation of politics by other means, and that's a very human thing. We seem to definitely be following a trend uh, this year with our definitions on the the course of war and how it's defined. It's very interesting. Uh, another dead Prussian quote I liked uh, was that war is uh, a human in interaction, uh, which is very close to yours. So you might be up there in terms of the scholarly achievements of Carl, that's actually not really fair to you. You've written your own books. He never wrote his own. He wrote a lot of books, but uh, he had to get other people to finish the one he's most famous for. Look, Peter, thanks very much for, one, letting me in the office and not calling security when I turned up, two, um, coming on the show, and three, agreeing to come on the show later, which you'll do after the podcast. Thanks, mate, and uh, beers are on you. All right, listeners, well, you heard that. I am just a poor podcast host who has to spend a lot of money uh, to keep the guests happy. So one way you can support the show that I don't make any money from, is by giving me some reviews on iTunes. By reviewing the podcast on iTunes, you then expand the audience and we can get the message out to more and more people so that we understand what war is, the implications of war, and how it affects humans. Because this is an important topic. But until next time, grab a book and crack on. Join the conversation with us on Twitter at Dead Prussian Pod, on Facebook at The Dead Prussian Page, or on our website www.thedeadprussian.com. All show notes for this episode, as well as copyright information, can be found on the website. The Dead Prussian Podcast is written, produced, and hosted by Mick Cook. It is co-produced by Amanda Levito. The music used throughout is Caught in the Beat by Broke for Free and is used under a Creative Commons Attribution License. All opinions expressed by individuals on the podcast are those of the individual and not necessarily representative of any other organisation.